Okay, it's time. It's time for our three o'clock session. So if you're getting coffee, snacks, uh, make your way back to your seats. And in just a few seconds, we'll get this um, session started. Um, did everyone try? Did everyone try to use this? And you're ready when you come up here. Let's see. Uh, I haven't even checked, but I see my slide. Okay. I'm sure everything's here. Um, all right. So Nick, we'll give this to you because you're first. It's that right arrow. We move them. Yeah. I'm not sure what that does. You could trust it. Um, all right, so I'm Heidi Grunwald. I'm the co-director at the Center for Public Health Law Research um, with Scott. I've been with this esteemed group. A lot of people in the room I haven't seen in a long time for 10 years, so it's great to see everyone and have everyone back for this celebration of the 10 years. Um, I'm going to do the same as the others, which is read the bios um, all together, and then we'll get this thing kicked. So Nick Terry is a professor of law at Indiana University School of Law, where he serves as executive director of the Hall Center for Law and Health and teaches courses on health care and health policy. His recent scholarship has dealt with health privacy, mobile health, Internet of Things, big data, AI, and the opioid overdose epidemic, which is I'm sure why you're here today. Um, he serves on IU's Grand Challenges Scientific Leadership Team, working on the addictions crisis and is the PI on Addiction Law and Policy Grand Challenge Grants. In that capacity, he re recently testified on opioids policy before the Senate Committee on Aging. He is one of the permanent bloggers at Harvard Law School's Bill of Health. And a fun fact, if you don't know, Nick has a podcast. And today, he just recorded his 167th podcast in the basement while well, we've been here. Leo Bolatsky is a professor of law and health science and faculty director for the Health and Justice Action Lab at Northeastern University School of Law. He holds a joint appointment at the Bouvet College of Health Sciences. His expertise is in the public health impact of laws and their enforcement with special focus on drug overdose, infectious disease transmission, and the role of criminal justice system as a structural determinant of health. Now, fun fact about Leo. I walked up to Leo and I said, Leo, give me a fun fact. He's like, oh, I don't know. Well, it turns out Leo has 9,734 Twitter followers. So he is an influencer in the Twitter sphere. And in fact, he has sent no less than nine tweets as we've been sitting here today. Rhonda, Rhonda Goldfine has led the AIDS Law Project of Pennsylvania since 2000. She is listed among the top 100 HIV AIDS activists in the United States by POZ Magazine and website. She was voted a super lawyer in a poll of more than 36,000 PA attorneys published jointly by Law and Politics and Philadelphia Magazine. Rhonda serves as vice president and secretary of Safe Houses Board, and fun fact, not so fun, is in the trenches of our legal battle right here in Philadelphia to open up the country's first supervised injection site. Evan Anderson is a senior lecturer at the University of Penn's School of Nursing. Uh, he conducts and writes about research that explores the relationship between laws and population health. A big part of his recent work has fo focused on bridging the gap between legal and epidemiological research, something we trained him well to do. Um, a fun fact about Evan is actually he was our first senior legal fellow at the National Program Office for Public Health Law Research. He had a big hand, a formative role 
in policy surveillance as we know it today and in the rawatlas.org website to know and love. So Devin Reeves is the executive director and co-founder of the PA Home Reduction Coalition. He's worked on the expansion of access to life-saving medication naloxone, implementation of good SAM policies, and the development of youth-oriented systems. He wants to build constituencies and consequences of consequence that will lead to meaningful public health policy changes around substance use disorders. Devin is our go-to guy for translation and dissemination in this city, as noted by his question to Michelle. A fun fact about Devin, he and his wife are expecting a baby boy in December, and they're fighting about the name. And as of right now, he's convinced he will lose that battle. All right. So let's get this started. Nick. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. Happy birthday, Scott and everyone at the center. Long been a fan, have no idea what I'm doing here. So my interest lies in aspects of the healthcare system, uh, particularly access to and delivery of care and how our healthcare system either perpetuates or creates structural determinants in the opioids use disorder space. Um, today, I'm going to just talk about the first of uh, these issues, uh, health coverage, and more specifically, uh, access to healthcare through the Medicaid system. I start with four maps, but I'm only going to talk about two in any detail. Uh, the first map, which I'll get to back to in a moment, contains the most recent data from the CDC about opioid overdose deaths. The second shows economic distress by county. It is, if you like, the diseases of despair map. The third is overall healthcare performance by state. And the fourth, states that have or have not adopted Medicaid expansion. Now, if I was a real social scientist, like most of the people here, I'd have some nice synthesis map. But for my purposes today, I'm going to ask you to uh, give me a far more uh, simplistic and noisy correlation by just looking at the relative similarities of maps two, three, and four. This is map one. Two points. First, these are our latest numbers on uh, the drug overdose deaths. Um, recent numbers uh, released by CDC have triggered White House uh, uh, thoughts about uh, landing on carriers and displaying mission accomplished um, uh, banners. Uh, a month ago or so, for example, we'd seen US death rates down 5.1% overall. But these the most recent numbers that just came out that actually show much smaller numbers on um, back to 3.4%. There are also some more wider divergences, for example, um, epicenter settings. Third, uh, yes, we've seen declines in deaths from prescription opioids, but fentanyl and similar uh, uh, fuel deaths continue to rise. Current issues tend to focus not only on um, synthetics such as fentanyl, but also on uh, methamphetamines, um, um, which at one point were not thought of as particularly deadly, but the latest cocktails that are coming in uh, uh, from Mexico and from China, from Mexico, seem to be leading to a spike in deaths. Why did this... Uh, other than giving you those latest statistics, why does this map not look quite like those other three? I think, uh, and as I say, because I'm not a real social scientist, I don't know, but I think or I surmise that the epicenter states 
uh, such as uh, the upper Midwest and even to an extent into Appalachia, uh, have introduced harm reduction methods, uh, there is a higher correlation with Medicaid expansion in those states. If you were to look at this map uh, two to three years ago, you would see a much stronger visual correlation uh, with those other uh, maps. So what is the income characteristic of the opioid uh, user look like? Those with non, uh, those with opioid use disorder, not just users. Um, KFS, Ogera, and Tolbert quote, nearly half of non-elderly adults with OUD had low incomes. Almost a quarter were living in poverty. In 2017, 49% of adults with OUD had incomes below 200% of the FPL, compared to only 34% of all non-elderly adults. Almost a quarter of those with OUD were poor, compared to just 15% of all non-elderly adults. Not surprisingly, therefore, uh, Medicaid uh, covers a disproportionate share of non-elderly adults with OUD, uh, some 38%, and an even greater share of those with low incomes. It is therefore not exactly uh, brain surgery to come to the conclusion that Medicaid, and particularly Medicaid expansion, is a massive key to undoing some of the opioid use disorder damage. This was recognized in the 2016 Surgeon General's report. Medicaid expansion is a key lever for expanding access to substance use treatment because many of the most vulnerable individuals with SUD have incomes below the 138 FPL. First, let me try and tear your attention away from the shocking number on the left of the screen. Uh, just over a third, 34% of adults with OUD received no, as in zero, drug or alcohol treatment. On the right, and the territory I'm going through at the moment, note that those with Medicaid were nearly twice as likely as those with private insurance to have, treat, to have uh, received drug or alcohol treatment. There are quite a few studies that expand on this idea of Medicaid, Medicaid expansion being key. In states that expanded Medicaid, the number of people hospitalized with an SUD who did not have health insurance decreased from about 20% in 2013 to 5% in 2015. After Kentucky expanded Medicaid, the state experienced a 700% increase in the utilization of substance use services. Between 2009 and 13, that's prior to expansion, the number of Medicaid-covered naloxone prescriptions was similar in Medicaid and non-Medicaid expansion states as we now know them. Those that later opted to expand program eligibility uh, uh, and, after, uh, and those that did not. After expansion, the pattern changed. In 2016, expansion states dispensed 38,000 naloxone prescriptions compared with 7,000 in non-expansion states. Medicaid expansion in California uh, was, this just came out in Health Affairs, I thought it was a staggering piece uh, uh, this week. Medicaid expansion in California has been associated with a reduction in the number of evictions with 24.5 fewer evictions per month in each county. Uh, 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 that's so important, right, when you're looking at a population where, that is challenged by, um, uh, by housing, by uh, the lack of stable housing. So that brings us to, the, uh, to map four, the current state of Medicaid expansion, which I think of as a map that shows the intense risk uh, that persons in uh, parts of the country who uh, have opioid use uh, disorder, suffer from opioid use disorder, have uh, a risk that uh, others do not have. But Medicaid expansion goes beyond just simply increasing the pool of the eligible. Medicaid also offers states tremendous opportunities for 
bringing in optional additive programs to help particular populations, particularly those with behavioral health. These additive programs or exceptional programs uh, frequently are uh, provided not because they are directly permitted by the Medicaid rules, but because the federal government will issue what are called Section 1115 waivers. So they waive aspects of the Medicaid rules. If the state says, hey, we've got this great idea, we're going to make healthcare better, we're going to stay within the basic Medicaid guidelines, but we're going to do these extra things. So the state said, yeah. So the feds will say, yes, that's a good trade-off. Subject to these guidelines, subject to you staying uh, within those tracks, yes, we'll do it. So we are seeing, and we have seen, uh, this hasn't changed that much from these 2017 numbers, um, the kinds of waivers that states ask for are to use Medicaid funds um, uh, in institutions for mental disease, IMDs, so um, inpatient care. Uh, those of you who um, read, as I did, because wasn't it a fun read, uh, HR6, the Support Act, um, uh, the, the last federal um, funding round and uh, reform round, uh, does bring in a temporary uh, 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 waiver on that for all, but it's sunsetted. Um, secondly, uh, you see states saying, can we uh, expand community-based behavioral health benefits, which in my opinion, at least I think, will be better than going to institutional, putting more funds into the institutional side. A third, expanding Medicaid eligibility to cover additional people with behavioral health needs. And for financing delivery system reforms, such as physical and behavioral health integration, alternate payment models, and so on. Don't have time to get into it here, but uh, my eye certainly has been drawn to North Carolina. Uh, there's an interesting uh, health opportunities pilot uh, that's going on in North Carolina, thanks to a waiver, uh, which uh, is bringing in wraparound services, which is something we're looking at. And in Tennessee, where the HealthLink primary uh, care uh, system has been introduced to, to increase um, uh, 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 primary health care for an, an early diagnosis, as burdensome for uh, those in this um, risk population. So Medicaid, Medicaid expansion, yay! There shall be victory. Well, be careful what you want to ask for, um, because to an extent, uh, Medicaid in front of our very eyes is in the process of morphing from a solution to a problem. Um, the Obama administration uh, encouraged uh, red states. Do you use red states instead of conservative, Scott? Do you object privacy? No, oh, he's gone. Um, <coughs> encourage red state Medicaid expansion by approving Section 1115 waivers that allowed sort of conservative talking point. Uh, policies, skin in the game ideas, and things like this. You know, payment of premiums, um, doing what everyone in the Medicaid population wants to do, which is to join a health club. Um, you know, because they, they're around the corner in, in most of these in most of these towns. LA Fitness, Zoom. Um, so, for example, Indiana uh, got a waiver. Um, uh, to uh, introduce some of these skin in the game things, even under the Obama administration. Um, unfortunately, um, it was a disaster. Um, oh, but did I tell you it was designed by now the CMS administrator? So, yeah. Um, Seema Um I was actually, I was going to the Humphrey building the other morning for a thing. And I got on the plane in Indianapolis airport and I'm sitting next to her. And I just couldn't. I just opened my laptop and worked and she, she fell asleep and I think it was the right solution for both of us. Um, so basically what happens is over 51% of those with income above 100% FPL uh, who were determined eligible for this next layer up, this what was called HIP 2.0, never enrolled in coverage or they lost coverage for failure to pay premiums. Um, the top two reasons cited by people who never enrolled was affo were affordability, we're talking about a population that a $5 uh, premium or something, let alone having a bank account that you can pay for it from, uh, were just not uh, possible. 
And there was tremendous confusion about whether what was the difference between hip, you know, good hip and special hip and so on. Now, the Trump administration takes over this 1115 waiver process and starts using the same process to allow states to introduce community engagement or work requirements as conditions of eligibility. Now, I don't really need to tell this group, I think, how fundamentally flawed that is. Uh, work requirements is backwards think, right? Medicaid has little or no positive effects on labor force supply. Rather, having health care and other safety net sub services supports work and job seeking. So the entire thing is backwards, but it's a wedge. So this is Arkansas. Arkansas is the only state that's been allowed to do this that actually got the plan out there. Um, everybody else is enjoined. Arkansas is now enjoined. We all knew that there would be a massive hit as far as the number of persons who lost coverage. 18,000 lost. But what's really interesting, and I think particularly troubling, is once lost, they tend not to come back or a large number of them tend not to come back into the system. So it's a, it's a continually sort of um, uh, self-reinforcing kind of uh, uh, removal of the eligible from our Medicaid system. What kind of numbers are we talking about? Well, Kentucky, as I said, is under um, both of its, its original waiver and now its reapproved waiver, which was almost identical, thank you, CMS. Um, Estimates say that about 108,000 people would lose Medicaid coverage as a result of the work requirement. Um, adding work requirements would increase the number of non-disabled adults churning off Medicaid um, in Kentucky from 108,000 to maybe 216,000. It's also, and here's a lever I wish people would use, it's really bad business. Um, in Kentucky, the estimate is the hospital operating margins would decline from 1.6% to 2.9%. A study with regard to New Hampshire's forthcoming um, uh, Medicaid expansion work requirement rule, uh, where obviously the, we know the feds pay 90%, um, new studies suggest new work requirements would mean losing about 7 to 11% of the state's entire general funds budget. I mean, it is, it is crazy town. So you say to yourself, but I've read these work requirements plans that have been approved by the federal government, and they have substance use disorder carve-outs. Well, sort of. Um, many people with SUDs won't be eligible for work requirement exemptions. Uh, by definition, the medically frail exemption includes people with chronic SUDs, but that suggests people must have had multiple episodes of substance use, or it must have persisted for a long time, so many won't meet the standard. Um, accommodations that are given under these rules for uh, uh, persons who are in SUD treatment, of course, founder for the usual reason, right? Which is, there is a lack of treatment centers. And so that's, uh, carve out probably won't, want, won't apply. Even if they are in treatment, one of the characteristics of those uh, with OUD, SUN, SUD generally is they churn in and out of treatment. Um, accommodations require paperwork and administrative requirements, the very things that the Indiana experiment showed decreased eligibility. This is not a population that carries uh, an iPad around with them with a cell connection so they can connect every day and say whether they're working. And the SUD diagnosis is based partly on whether the person's substance use results in a failure to meet major responsibilities at work, school, or home, which means you have another sort of vicious sort of feedback loop here. I think overall, um, I would like to uh, leave you with uh, the sense that although um, these work requirements and their fellow travelers are currently enjoined uh, in uh, federal district court, uh, appeals are ongoing, or will start soon, and we have an ever fickle Supreme Court. And so I think overall the bottom line is uh, 
the OUD population may well end up uh, likely losing uh, arguably uh, their greatest uh, uh, method of achieving treatment uh, through access through the Medicaid system. Thank you. Just cheering. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. All right. Hi, everyone. Thanks for sticking around for this last panel. Um, just wanted to add my voice to those who have congratulated um, the center and Scott in particular for uh, 10 years of pioneering work and, and also highlight what hasn't been said, which is that um, the center has been an incubator for a lot of folks uh, who are out there doing really great work, um, Evan and Kay, myself, and many others. So, so in terms of kind of workforce development, the center has done really, really important work. Um, so I wanted to talk about um, the, uh, an element of the current overdose crisis that isn't discussed uh, very much, although that's maybe changing. Uh, which is the rise and expansion of drug-induced homicide laws and prosecutions as a response to um, the overdose crisis. And, and this is in the category of, um, you know, Michelle was saying that, you know, they're, they're separating good ideas from bad ideas, and, and this is certainly in the latter um, category. Um, before I do that, I think it's worth um, harping on the theme of the day, which is focused on policy narratives and how legal epi can help uh, formulate policy narratives. Um, and, and I'll be talking about that. But I think it's also important to actually drill down even a little deeper to look at the language that we use, um, because that oftentimes is um, highly determinative of the, of the policy response. Um, and this is something that um, in my lab, we're trying to work on um, through the Changing the Narrative initiative, which actually looks at the language that's used in media and policy and tries to reshape that language to be more in line with the evidence and more in line with kind of a health-based response. Um, just as an example, um, the word substance abuse, which is standard in policy discussions and other discussions of, of addiction, um, is problematic. Why is it problematic? Would anyone venture to say? What, what other areas, where else do we use the word abuse? Domestic abuse, child abuse, right? Do we use abuse with any other health issue? Like, do we have sugar abuse? No, we don't. And so um, the word abuse, which is standard, unfortunately, is by definition, criminalizing. So if we're trying to change um, our approach from a health, from, from a criminalization approach to a health approach, as, as a lot of people have been talking about, and at the same time, they're using the word abuse, um, those things are acting across purposes. And um, just wanted to plug, uh, we have a, a site called uh, changingthenarrative.news that kind of talks about some of these terms um, and highlights alternative ways of of um, describing certain uh, phenomena that are related to addiction and overdose. So the, the prevailing narrative about the overdose crisis, um, and we heard about some of this this morning, is that um, you know this we're, we're now seeing it as a, as a health. We're seeing addiction and overdose as a health issue. And that, you know, there are many reasons for that. Some of that has to do with race, the fact that, you know, uh, the prevailing narrative is, you know, since white people are dying, we're now using, we're now, we're now um, addressing this as a health issue. Well, there's actually, that narrative is wrong on both sides, um, uh, on both elements. First of all, it's not a white issue, and we're not actually using a health approach. We're using health rhetoric but we're not really using a health approach. So it's basically rebranding criminalization in many spaces, rebranding criminalization as health. And as one of the um, uh, areas that I'll talk about. Um, 
the specific and the, you know there are many examples of this such as for example um uh civil commitment laws uh which we've worked with law atlas on on uh mapping out um uh which essentially rebrand uh jailing people as treatment and you know reframing jails as if they were therapeutic um but also uh this particular uh, area of law that i'll be talking about today which is using uh punishment and uh interdiction drug interdiction and law, drug law enforcement as an overdose prevention measure and a lot of the language um that's used in in policy discussions um and in the way that prosecutors are talking about these efforts co-ops the health narrative and is saying you know we really care about people uh, who are dying of overdose, and therefore we're implementing these punitive measures um so drug-induced homicide laws are not new they date back to the 80s to the height of um sort of the crack uh the crack epidemic um and we worked with law alice in creating a data set that that looks at various elements of these laws and these laws are on the books um, in 25 jurisdictions so these are laws that essentially criminalize someone who distributes drug to a person who then ends up dying right so so um you know i use it with a friend i go out and um get some drugs we use to together and that person um overdoses and dies i can be charged with distributing drugs resulting in death and therefore um, I'm liable for a crime that usually carries a mandatory minimum of somewhere between uh, 10 and 20 years. So these laws um, have been um, cropping up, new laws have cropped up and, and old laws have been expanded as a, as a response to the overdose crisis. Um, and you know this database um, provides the details, various details of those illegal interventions. But I actually wanted to highlight um, something that uh, that goes beyond this traditional kind of legal epidemiological approach, which is to track laws, track policies, um, because we're we're using um, novel big data techniques to assess how actively these laws are being deployed. Um, um, uh Because data are actually, even though they're supposedly public, are incredibly hard to um, to collate and to analyze. A lot of times, it's uh, PDFs. And what else? What's that? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, he is absolutely right. So if the if the mechanism by which these laws are designed to quote unquote send a signal, which is the language that prosecutors use, then the signal is going to function through the news media and theoretically through social media as well, which is something that we need to look at. And so having um so so we have amassed a database of news mentions of drug induced homicide prosecutions across time and you see the trend is very clear here to just to highlight this is just the tip of the iceberg these are just news mentions that we were able to find we're probably missing some uh news mentions but of, overall of course you know this is just a small subset of actual prosecutions um 
Pennsylvania, your, the state that we're in, actually is first in the United States in terms of the number of drug-induced homicide prosecutions. They're not distributed equally in Pennsylvania either. Um, Lancaster County, Allegheny County, and other um, places in, in Western Pennsylvania are, um, and Central Pennsylvania are the most active. And so, um, you know, some prosecutors are really leaning on these, um, on these tools to signal to their constituencies that they're doing something about this problem. When you look at the um, overall, uh, dis you know, in many ways, this is a traditional drug war tool, and the data that we have on the impact, disproportionate impact of the drug war um, is uh, very much present here. Uh, in terms of the sentencing disparities, uh, people of color receive far longer sentences um, than white defendants. Um, we also looked, uh, we did a deep dive on the subset of these news missions and um, uh, wanted to assess whether or not the prosecutorial narrative about drug-induced homicide prosecutions is correct. And the narrative is we're taking drug dealers off the street, we're taking kingpins off the street, we're we're reducing the number of drugs that are, that are present in our communities. In fact, that turns out not to be true because if you if you look at the actual prosecutions, um, the majority of them target friends, family members, and other people in the closest circle to the uh, person who dies of an overdose. So these people are not, by no means are kingpins, and a lot of times is not even sale that's, um, uh, uh, that factors into this relationship. Most of the time, since drug use is a social phenomenon, most of the time it's just other people who use drugs. So, in fact, we're going after the kind of the lowest folks on the you know ladder, the lowest rungs, and putting them away for uh, 20, 30 years, or you know sometimes less if you're white. Um, uh, which is, you know, really uh, strange credulity as far as this narrative around, you know, we're, we're uh, reducing the supply of drugs on the street. Um, I would challenge the notion that, you know, police have really internalized this idea that we can't arrest out of this, our way out of this problem. In fact, drug-induced homicide prosecutions are doing exactly that. And I think that what has happened is that there's been a switch in the rhetoric, but the switch in the actions has actually remained the same. And this is true of Philadelphia here um, in terms of, you know, police actions to clear homeless encampments and other kinds of activities. Um, I also think that um, there's a danger um, to essentially allowing police to take on this health role without a critical assessment of what is actually happening. So, uh, for example, there's a lot of programs that um, have been heralded as successes uh, where police act as a gateway to treatment. So show up, you know, they're called angel programs. Show up to the police station, we will forgive um, any drug convictions, we will connect you to treatment. So that's something that might work in Chestnut Hill, but it may not work in Ferguson, Missouri, right? Because policing has a legacy of trauma with certain communities and certain people, which may act as a barrier for folks using police in that kind of treatment capacity. And there's a danger in hardwiring access to treatment through these criminal justice settings because it's going to systematically exclude certain people. Now, as someone who works with police a lot, um, I think that, you know, there's a middle ground and not, I'm not approaching it from kind of an abolition standpoint. I'm not saying that, you know, police should not engage in these kinds of um, uh, health oriented or social work oriented changes. What I'm saying is that, you know, from a harm reduction perspective, and as a harm reductionist, I would say we have to meet the world where it is. And where it is, is that police are having a lot of encounters with people who use drugs, with mentally ill people, um, with other people who need support. We have de-invested and um, 
essentially de-emphasize other systems of care. And so all we're left with is policing, jails, and prosecutors. And so from that standpoint, we have to meet those systems where they're at. And we have to make those systems more humane, more evidence-based, and think about how to create off-ramps into systems of care. But at the same time, our long-term goal should never be to net widen policing to become social workers and treatment providers. It should be to shift those tasks and those resources to other systems of care and limit the role of police and limit the resources that police gets um, to deal with social, mental health and other um, kinds of needs in the community. And um, I guess I will end there. Thank you. Um, give me a little. Oh, there I am. Thank you so much. Which one advances? Uh, that one. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Randy. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Randy Goldfine from the AIDS Law Project of Pennsylvania. And I'm here to talk about something different from the AIDS Law Project, but I feel like I can't come and not give a little love to my day job. So the AIDS Law Project of Pennsylvania is the nation's only independent public interest law firm. In our more than 31 years, we have provided free legal services to more than 45,000 people living with HIV throughout Pennsylvania and Southern New Jersey. And we've done that with our mighty staff and our cooperating attorneys, so Professor Burris. Uh, and so we're pretty proud of that. What we've seen with the clients of the AIDS Law Project is that the good news, right? You guys have been tracking this stuff. Things are a whole lot better in many ways for people living with HIV. And so back in the day, we were just helping people die. I mean, we were trying to get them to some health care that we knew wasn't going to save them. We were trying to make a difference for people, keep them in their jobs as long as they, they could stay there. But we knew that it looked bleak. And then we had a treatment revolution. And things were looking really great. And for many of our clients, because they have gotten to the point of getting to a lawyer, that means they're engaged in care, the viral load is suppressed. They're doing great. Their life expectancy is on par with their peers who don't have HIV. Things are looking pretty good. And our practice changed from helping people with their final days to helping them move forward and build futures now that they had them. And that was really great. And it is really great. But what we saw um, is that people with HIV were doing better, that our brothers and sisters in Philadelphia were not, who were struggling with opioid use we're not doing so well. And we saw that the death toll was increasing in Philadelphia from 2015. Uh, in 2015, it was 500 overdose deaths. 2016, 900 overdose deaths. 2017, 1,200 overdose deaths. And we had a little bit of a reduction last year. So we, we were at 1,100 last year, which is, as we like to say, a catastrophically high number that's only slightly better. Right, this is out of control. And so our city recognized that it was out of control and their city convened a task force and you know got, got big thinkers to, to look at what are the things we can do? How can we address this? How can we make it better? And so they came up with 18 recommendations. There was a big press conference and the rec one of the recommendations was supervised injections, right? Stuff works. they has been studied. There's 120 sites around the world. They've been in operation for 30 years. They show no fatalities in the site. They show decreased overdose fatalities in the vicinity, decreased public consumption, decreased litter related to um, drug use, and no impact on crime, which makes sense because it's not a crime fighting measure. It's a public health measure. So we're like, this is great. So the city has a big press conference. They say very clearly, they will support and encourage, but not fund. They will take um, proposals from providers who can provide this type of service, and it'll be great. And so um, everyone, when we had the press conference, folks in the room were looking at our colleagues at Prevention Point Philadelphia, which is a needle exchange site, the city's only legal needle exchange site that's been in operation for about 27 years. And people said, okay, well, clearly Prevention Point's going to open up a site. This is pretty good. How hard could this be? 
Prevention Point contacted the AIDS Law Project because we have a working relationship with them. We've had free legal services on site for, I don't know, 15 years or so. We're thinking, okay, this can't be hard, you know, because after all, Scott and Leo wrote a law review article more than 10 years ago with a total roadmap. Oh, forgive me, Evan. Forgive me, Evan. So, you know, we had a roadmap. We're ready to go. Except the roadmap required the state to step up and do their part in this. And nobody was stepping up. Like, nobody anywhere was stepping up. And so we said, okay, we'll do it ourselves. Because, you know, we're Philadelphians. We're tough. That's how we are. Um, so we convened a roundtable of just a ton of lawyers, and we looked at what the issues are. Pretty clearly, we said that the big issue, of course, was that little federal law problem, right? So part of the Controlled Substance Act has a crackout statute, which makes it illegal to maintain a premises for drug-involved uh, activities. Actually, forgive me. Okay. This is... So, uh, we decided that because of that law, that was kind of scary to all of us, because it did have, after all, a penalty of up to 20 years in jail, a quarter of a million dollar fine, and a civil asset forfeiture, we thought, ah, you know, like, we're badass in Philadelphia, but maybe we need to create something slightly different. So, we created a nonprofit thinking that would just shield us all and protect us all. I mean, whether it would or wouldn't, who knows for sure. I know in one of the meetings where we said, okay, we'll create a nonprofit, there was a white collar criminal defense lawyer in the room who said, I need to tell you, you're all co conspirators. Like, if you're not okay with that, you need to leave. And if you're okay with it, just so you know. So we're like, okay, you know, yeah, I'm feeling a little uneasy, but still, we're seeing people dying at an alarming rate. We have no choice. So we decided we we're going to create this nonprofit, Jose Benitez and myself. And then we said, well, we need a Philly champion, right? And so for those of you who live in Philadelphia, you know, for better or worse, there's no bigger champion than Ed Rendell, right? Now, after all, Ed Rendell, two terms of governor, two terms of mayor, former district attorney. And when he was mayor, it was his authorization that allowed the syringe exchange to open. And uh, if the governor were here, he would tell you his favorite story, which is when the state police called to say, we're going to arrest everyone at the syringe exchange. He said, oh, don't bother going to Kensington. Come down to Center City. Come to City Hall, second floor. You'll find my office. Arrest me. I'll be there. So there was never any arrest, but he's kind of proud, and we are proud of him, that prevention point moved forward from that from that time. So we figured, okay, Ed's our guy. We went to talk to Ed. He couldn't have been more interested and more willing. And so now we have this nonprofit, and we're thinking, okay, what do we have? We don't have the state stepping up like Scott and Leo and Evan said they should, but we do have an incredibly brave health commissioner. Right. Uh, Dr. Farley, who's the Philadelphia Health Commissioner, has invested every drop of political capital into this initiative. If this goes south, he's not getting a job as like a dog catcher. Right? That's done. He's done. We have a, a managing director's office and a mayor who on most days are in support. So that's good. Maybe you've heard we have an incredibly progressive district attorney. Right. So Larry Krasner is on board. And more or less, the state is, after a little few bumps with Attorney General Josh Shapiro, he kind of said, you know, I don't see a state law issue here, and, you know, you guys roll on, and if there's a problem, I'll let you know. So we're all feeling pretty good about that. You know, we've got, we've got our nonprofit. We filed for 501c3 status. Like, okay, this looks like this could happen. And then Rod Rosenstein writes his awful op-ed where he's talking about uh, he's coming after everybody. You know, it's, he's coming after funders and participants, and, and he's just going to shut down everyone. Then he comes to Philadelphia, and he does uh, a radio interview with WHYY, which we were calling like 18 nasty minutes with Rod, which frankly sounds kind of like a play film. But, um, but we decided we had to move forward, and the reason why is because this is what's happening. There is a supervised injection site all over Philadelphia. People see people consuming everywhere, right? And so we have to do better than that. So we're deciding 
we're going to do something and we're ready to go. And because there were um, lots of new stories, because part of this Philadelphia story of how the stars were aligning with Governor Rendell and Prevention Point and strong harm reductionists like my pal Devin and all of these angels aligning, the press was part of those angels, fair, neutral, unbiased press, but some of them completely got why this was necessary. So there's a story in the paper about how the federal government is trying to stop Philadelphians from helping Philadelphians, and a lawyer in town reads it and says, that can't be right. I want to help. And so Alana Eisenstein of DLA Piper brings the weight of her international law firm and says, we want to help. Is that okay? We're like, game changer, right? Because now it's like us talking tough, but now we have the weight of this international law firm behind us. We're ready to go. And so now we're deciding, well, what do we do? Because we're in this odd position of like, respectfully disagreeing with the U.S. attorney on the legality of a supervised consumption site. And you can, you know, respectfully disagree with the neighbors, but you can't really respectfully disagree with the U.S. attorney. You know, like, we didn't want him sending in, you know, jack FBI agents to arrest people. These folks are, like, living really complicated lives. Being arrested by the FBI wasn't going to be a thing that was a good move for them. So we're deciding, what do we do? What do we do? Should we file the declaratory judgment action? Should we call the question? Should we, you know, should we open? And as we're kind of deciding every day, we like have a different conclusion. It felt like we were playing chicken with the U.S. Attorney's Office. And they went first. So they sued us. And while it may seem odd to say that we were glad we were sued because nobody wants to be sued by anyone, let alone the federal government, you know, like this was a question that had to be called. And so in February, U.S. Attorney called the question, filed a civil declaratory judgment action. So when we heard that we were sued and it was civil, we were like, oh, civil. Uh, you know, we're not all going to jail. It was like such a a uh, a moment of relief for everyone. So we filed our response, not to get too civil procedure wonky here, but we filed our response. We filed a counterclaim. We moved forward, um, and in uh, the beginning of the summer, the U.S. Attorney filed a motion for the judgment on the pleadings. Right, so we and um, we said no. We need more facts. We're not ready. We can't make a decision just based on the paperwork. We believe there are more facts that are required. We wanted to say how we're putting it on, what we're doing, what it looks like. And so the judge scheduled uh, an evidentiary hearing, limited to the nuts and bolts of how we intend to put it on. He then scheduled oral arguments on the question of how we interpreted um, uh, the Controlled Substance Act. You know, we think both of those things went well. It showed who the U.S. Attorney's Office is, uh, who the U.S. Attorney is. At one point, he was doing this. So you say you save people, you save them, and if they die later, did you save them? And it became pretty clear that there was something inherent in that message about, like, are these people worth saving? And aren't you dishonest to say that you're saving them? So we had that, we had the evidentiary hearing. We thought that that would be used for his decision, the motion for the judgment and the pleadings. Then we had the oral arguments, strong arguments again. We're feeling really good about it. Judges, for anyone who knows Judge McHugh and Obama appointee, uh, raised in uh, West Philly, a very fair, smart, thoughtful judge. He uh, said that he wasn't going to use any of the evidence from the hearings to help him decide on the motion for the judgment and the pleadings, which has, like us all, in yet another procedural wonkiness. But as he was trying to keep a fair and balanced session, when the U.S. attorney on the rebuttal said that why would we do this when we know it's wrong? Uh, the judge kind of slipped and said, well, maybe it's the death toll. Maybe it's the rising death toll. He also said when the U.S. attorney tried to accuse us of hubris, like there's something just so wrong about trying to save lives, the judge said he had a hard time assigning bad motives to people who were trying to save lives. So, that all happened September 5th. 
We're waiting to see what happens next. Technically, if you're any civil procedure experts in here, I'm happy to think about this. I mean, I think technically the next thing that has to happen is a motion for a judgment on the pleadings. Although I guess he could decide on that and go to the merits or decide on that and then go to summary judgment. I mean, I think that there's a lot of interesting things that could happen. So we're waiting and we're watching. And it's, uh, as I was saying to my pal Devin, a little nerve wracking. But I believe we're on the side of the angels. And so it's the right thing to do. So if you're interested in, oh, I have my mark. Yes. This is what we plan to do. So this is the whole safe house model, otherwise known as Exhibit 1. Uh, and I have plenty of these cards, which also has our website. But you'll see that what we're envisioning is a medically supervised model that allows a person access to treatment. The models throughout the country are different. Some of them is related to how they have their healthcare delivery system. In Canada, their, their models are based on you save somebody's life, isn't that great? You give them some naloxone, and they come back tomorrow, later today, later today, later today. Um, but they're also, we heard that their, their healthcare system is such that if you wanted to go into treatment, it's a six month wait. There's no six month wait for treatment for opioid use. You know, so we we understood their challenges, but we built our system a bit different. So you go in, you get assessed, we say what type of services do you want? You go into the medically supervised consumption room, you get sterile equipment, which is completely lawful under federal law. You get um, you can go in and if there's an overdose, we begin to show signs of an overdose. You will save your lives with your oxygen or oxygen, whatever is required. And just to be clear, we can really give out injection equipment and you can really save somebody's life with your oxygen. But the U.S. attorney thinks that that very small sliver in between you when you participate in that very small sliver, that that's the point for health care providers to say, no, you can't use here, go outside, go in those with a shuttle bar in between the two cars. like you can live a different life there is an end at this tunnel you can you can reclaim your life if that's what you want to do and then we uh folks check out and we get some additional data from them offer more services and give them the oxygen pretty straightforward so we are optimistic we have our collective fingers crossed and uh i'm sure we'll hear what happens next so thank you all right. Hi, everyone. Thanks. Thank you for again. So, uh, Leo touched on some of the a little bit of the content that I was going to mention. So, I might pass along some of my time to the QA. I want to talk about um, some of my research and a couple observations, and also maybe a, a tension um, that I think is just interesting to talk about. Um, I want to start with a, with a piece of research from pretty recently where some colleagues and I. Um, we, we got the identifying information for almost a thousand people who fatally overdosed and we retrospectively tracked their contacts with the criminal justice system. We had a couple research aims when we were doing this. One was we were generally interested in transitions in, in housing, in, um, in drug use patterns. We thought that we could maybe see some indicia of that in the types of charges and the patterning of the charges. We we're interested in whether court therapeutic programs are having actual therapeutic benefits. We thought we could look at that as well. Um, and 
and we were thinking about opportunities to intervene. So that, those are our sort of three aims. So um, of this population of, of 900 people, there were about 5,000 arrests and about uh, 4,000 court dispositions. We did not look at, at sort of non-final dispositions, status updates, parole, probation hearings. A right? um, couple, couple observations about our findings. One was that the, the data was, the data were, I, shall, I should say, um, were rich and, and they said a lot. And one of those sort of, as many of you know, one of the sort of, sort of core theories in, in um, this type of work is the sort of risk environment. And you might expect to see certain types of arrests coinciding with uh, risk of overdose. And, and we saw that. So crimes of homelessness, right, were much more common immediately preceding death. Other sorts of crimes showed no sort of trend um, proceed, um, in the time preceding fatal overdose. But you saw this very noticeable uptick in the, in the year uh, and in a few months before fatal overdose. Um, and just a sort of parenthetical to, to Leo's point and, and sort of the methodologists out there, it is very difficult to do this sort of research. Historically, court records have lived on PDFs, and we did use multiple coders to redundantly code them. Um, but nowadays, you can also write code that will pull them. So uh, the big data miners have figured this out. They've done this in most court systems. In Philadelphia, there's a eight digit ID for every person. Lots of researchers around town have rented Amazon servers, used combinatorics, 0000001, They're running constantly, they've downloaded the entirety, 45 years of court history. And then scraping those PDFs is not that hard anymore either. So um, interestingly enough, sure, absolutely. Uh, interestingly enough though, I just plug our district attorney, they're, they're doing the same thing. And they want to make this data available and salient in, in health research. So if you have a hypothesis, they're a great partner to work with. They help me with my project. Um, you know, one of the, the sort of main, I think, important findings of our, of our research, though, with a very noticeable practical application, but also a little bit of attention, um, very few, if any, of, our, of the folks in our population, um, notwithstanding their many contacts, very few of them went through a therapeutic court. And that was explained simply by the fact that um, almost all of them were ineligible. So the population as a whole at death, um, somewhere around 60% were ineligible for a specialized court program. Among folks who had an arrest within a year or two of death, that went up to pretty much everyone. 99, 98, 99% of those folks would not have been eligible for one of the courts that's ostensibly aimed at, at providing them services, right? Now, eligibility criteria are too high. We have this perverse uh, situation where we have drug treatment courts that often don't actually uh, provide services to people who would most benefit from them. The Temple undergrad with a pound of weed in his room is more likely to get in than the person with 15 retail thefts who might benefit from more intensive services. That's setting aside this whole issue that, that Leo, I think, rightly notes, which is, you know, it's problematic using coercion anyways, probably. So, you know, thinking about that whole model, I think, is an interesting question. It's so far down, it's so far away from the moment of, of uh, the health crisis that probably, um, produce the interaction with the officers. Drug treatment court's gonna be six months after someone had an arrest. You know, we know from the sort of sequential intercept model that, you know, and from the stages of change, the closer in temporality you try to intervene with someone, the more likely you are to have a benefit. So I thought, you know, I'd, I'd also talk a little bit about police assisted diversion. It came up earlier and, and Leo also kind of hinted at it. So um, I am evaluating the city's police assisted diversion program. And I won't, um, I won't say anything about my findings in that regard, but I would, I would just, um, which, which are still ongoing, but I would just note the, the sort of public data, which I think are interesting. So in the co-responder model, and someone had asked us earlier whether it's public, it is. Um, in the co-responder model, there have been uh, over 800 engagements with an officer paired with a social worker or behavioral health specialist, a considerable amount. Um, and in the, the PAD, the straight PAD model, there have been 500 referrals. 
Uh, interesting thing here, half of them have been social contact referrals, which is to say people in the community uh, flagging down an officer and saying, hey, I heard you have a program I'd like in, can you take me there? And again, the, the potential benefit here is that the uh, law enforcement can facilitate that at a moment, right, which is, which is very close to that time when someone might be ready to change. That's a good thing. Again, lots of concerns about medicalizing, you know, about the um, people without health training playing health roles, but also just, you know, it's notable that that many people out in the community are reaching out to police for services, I think is, a, is an important point. Um, final point to, to, that I just wanna make another sort of effort that I'm working on that I think is, is just important to think about in this area, um, not, not thinking about uh, independent variable of law, but the dependent variable of the harms associated with with uh, opioid use disorder. So, I mean, the, op the overdose statistics are ast astonishing and horrifying, um, but this really is a syndemic where there are other harms that are rising, which are really a considerable source of suffering. Um, those are hard to study at the population level. And um, some colleagues and I have been looking at discharge data, partly to make the cost proposition um, stronger in terms of the value of harm reduction efforts. You know, a lot of the, the harms and, and a lot of the really expensive ones are things like cellulitis, uh, bacteremia, things that uh, you often don't see papers on. You see papers on infective endocarditis. We don't see papers on the skin and soft tissue infections as much. Or the head trauma. And again, thinking about the value proposition, when someone, um, when someone nods off on the street and, and they're using drugs on a stoop and they hit their heads, that's such an easily, I mean, you can prevent that with a chair, right? And it doesn't, doesn't take much to prevent that, right? Um, we, don't, we don't talk about the, in, in sort of policy circles, we don't talk about the fact that, you know, that person's, if that person is, is seen and their overdose is reversed, that's wonderful. But then they go to the emergency department and because they have a laceration on their head, the ED says, oh, let's activate the trauma team. That's $27,000 a pop, right? Uh, for something that could have been prevented with a, with a chair. So I think there are other ways to define these problems uh, if we think more broadly about the syndemic as a syndrome. So it's kind of syndromic uh, surveillance, I think can be a powerful way to make the cost proposition a little stronger. That's all I have. I'm going to turn it over to Devin. I like hearing Devin present, so I give him as much time as possible. Always feel weird standing around the podium. Hi, everybody. That was super lame. Um, hi. Hi, Dad. Oh, right. So, got to use the mic. Got to use. It's on. It's on. Can you hear me? Okay. How many people live in Pennsylvania? Ah, oh, awesome. Buckle up, people. <laughs> uh, so, um, I've had like a really wild week. I was at. Mass General earlier this week talking about Recovery Month. I was at, what was that place called? College of Physicians. College of Physicians, like two days ago, talking to a bunch of doctors. And in general, my analysis of the problem is that people don't really care. People don't care. People don't really care. Uh, most people don't care unless they're directly affected. And Leo kind of touched on it. For a long time, we felt like this was a black people thing, right? In Philly, in North Philly, God forbid, not the Northeast, not on the main line. It's over there. Even when we catch kids on the main line selling drugs, they don't go to jail. Did anybody see that Felicity Hoffman got 15 days in jail for like being this like 14, I'm sorry, 14 days in jail. So like white people good, don't deserve to go to jail no matter how horrendous their thing is. Black woman lies about her address, gets 20 years in jail. So a kid can go to a good school. And some researcher, PhD, MPH person said, oh, if you go to a better school district, you're like more likely to live longer. So she was literally trying to save her kid's life 
Go to jail for 20 years. Felicity, Frank's wife from um, that show, 14 days. So this is me. This is a picture of me. I'm on social media. You should follow me. I just think this picture is cool because it's in front of Philly. So I put it on all my presentations. Uh, and people care about the overdose epidemic, not because you know anything about it, because the newspaper tells you that it's a good idea. Right? The newspaper is like, you know, 2014, 2015, Corey Maniath dies. He's like the sweetheart of America. He's on Glee. We watch it. There's all these newspaper articles like heroin is in the suburbs now. It's on the front page of the Inquirer. You're like, honey, did you read this? Heroin is in the front page. And it's, it's, in the, it's in the main line. It's affecting white people. These are real headlines. I'm not making this up. I know I joke a lot. But, but the truth is, is that this isn't even our biggest problem, right? I think Evan touched on this. Really, our, our unspoken problem is uh, communicable disease, right? It's easily quantifiable. We know how to fix it. We're really not doing anything to fix it. So there was an outbreak of uh, HIV amongst people who use drugs in Indiana when Mike Pence was the governor. And he totally did everything to like lean into that, right? He was like, people want to have abortions at Planned Parenthood, let's get rid of those, right? And those were also the places that where people go to get checked for HIV. And it turned out into this like perfect storm of idiocy that led to an HIV outbreak. And there's like some little like small town doctor who's like, hey, I've seen a lot of people with HIV, maybe we should do something about this, right? And it wasn't until it reached like a really big problem, the Obama administration had to come in and like smack people around that they declared a state of emergency. Uh, and they were like, oh, I guess we're gonna have to expand all these harm reduction practices. And what it comes down to is that everyone felt like we had this HIV thing under control. I think it's like men who have sex with men, people who don't use condoms, like we don't have outbreaks. That's what happens to black people in Africa. And again, this isn't what I think. This is what I make up that you think. Um, and I don't think I'm wrong, by the way. Uh, but, so this smart person at CDC says, well, let's see who else is at risk, right? And so some fancy science person did fancy science stuff and came up with other places that are at risk of outbreaks of HIV and hepatitis C amongst people who use drugs. Do you know that the entire state of Pennsylvania is at risk? The, whole, the entire state, look at green, at risk. Pennsylvania, green. We've actually got three of the top 220 counties in the entire state, Luzerne, Cambria, and Crawford. I've talked to all the state legislators that live in that district. They don't know that. that well, they know now because I told them, but they didn't know beforehand. And this thing's from like 2016. This is like mad old then. So here we are with the state with the most overdose deaths, third most per capita, at risk of an HIV and hepatitis C outbreak, documented outbreak, in the city of Philadelphia and, the, and an uptick in the suburbs. And like, I'm the only person talking about this. Right, me and some other like HIV. <coughs> and like my colleague said, soft tissue infections. You know, um, I had this friend, Charlie, who was like the best. Uh, he was a mainline kid, he played lacrosse, hurt his shoulder or something, started shooting dope. But like he had a problem with drugs, he went to his parents and I got a problem, he get some help. Went to treatment, moved into my halfway house, Billy Love House, long since gone, running a halfway house, terrible business. He lived there, he did everything I asked him to do. He made his bed every day, he got a job, he went to meetings, he got a sponsor. After he got out of my house, he called me, he said, Devin, I'm sick. I said, what's wrong? I said, I'm in the hospital. And I thought like he had HIV. And I'm like, Charlie, it's okay. Like they got medicine for that now. They'll fix you right up. He goes, nah, it's in my heart, come see me. Oh. So I go down to Jefferson or whatever, and I pray with them, and I talk to the nurse, and like, he didn't even make it. And I was like, oh. So we pray together, and I get a call a couple days later, he didn't make it. That's because Charlie didn't have access to sterile syringes, because he didn't want to go to the hospital, because hospitals suck. Um, and because he didn't know that he was at risk of a soft tissue infection. He didn't know any of these things. And the people that are supposed to help him were ill-prepared or mean to him when he went. So he died. And we don't talk about that when the governor of uh, Pennsylvania throws a press conference because we've had a 10% decrease in overdose deaths. None of this. My wife's uh, cousin died of like falling over, hitting her head in Philly for lack of a $5 chair as an intervention, as it turns out, which I never thought of it that way. And again, we have this idea that people should recover like this. Right, like every day I should be more healthy and more well, have more money, be more stable. 
And that's how recovery looks like, right? Like some days you're doing great and then your wife yells at you and calls you an idiot so you drink. Or you're stressed out at work and you smoke a joint. And when you do those things, the criminal justice system says, you know what, you should probably go back to jail because that's going to teach you a lesson. And you've now lost all your momentum in your recovery and you're actually more likely to die when you get out than get better. Because people who are getting out of jail are uh, 40 to 120 times more likely to die of an overdose than the regular population. So we're catching people doing whatever and then sending them to death. And uh, our perspective when we treat people who use drugs should be harm reduction based, right? It's engaging people where they're at. And a lot of people doesn't know what harm reduction is or like they've heard it or a blog or something or they follow Leo on Twitter. Uh, this is what harm reduction is right here. Hey, what's up fam? How you doing? What, what you need? Oh, you need some clean socks? I got some socks. You hungry? Here's a sandwich. Do, do you want, do you want a, some help stopping drugs? No, okay, like you got clean works? Boom, here's some sterile needles. Uh, do you need some Narcan? Boom, here's some Narcan. You need a bus pass? Let me get you a bus pass. You see that? I'm asking the person what they need and then I'm giving it to them. While the treatment system says, you gotta do this and you gotta do that. And if you don't do all this the exact right way, you're no good. Which really looks a lot like this, which is what law enforcement does. And we're surprised when that doesn't work for people. And there are actually many pathways to recovery, right? You can go to 12-step meetings. A lot of colored folk like going to the black church to get well. But we often have criminal justice system that say, if you don't go to AA meetings, we're going to send you to jail. We have professional health programs that say, if you don't go to AA meetings, you can't get your license done. It's, a, it's clearly a religious program that is Judeo-Christian in nature. I got sober with a guy who was a Muslim. And he was like, I don't like going to AA meetings because they say the Lord's Prayer at the end and that creeps me out. In general, I find white people creepy is what he would say to me. And I was like, I feel that, dog. White people make me nervous too. But he was under supervision of the court and that's what he had to do. So that's what he did. There's also this great tool called medication for opioid use disorder or medication assisted recovery. There's three FDA approved medications for opioid use disorder. And did you know that most treatment centers in Pennsylvania do not offer all three? No, you didn't know that. Isn't that terrible? They're ridiculous. I appreciate your interaction. By the way. Okay, well, good. I'm glad you're here listening. Yes. Um, so uh, what it comes down to is we should be using really what's called like a medication first <laughs> intervention. Like here's some medicine to make you feel better. I don't know about you. Like I said, my wife, she runs everything in my house. My wife is a... Uh, Cardiac ICU nurse, a pediatric cardiac ICU nurse. She works with babies and CHOP that are like missing half their heart. So when I get sick, I get no sympathy, none. Okay, even when my daughter gets sick, zero sympathy, right? Um, and she's like, suck it up, go to work. No, I will not rub your back. Uh, because her threshold for BS is very low. But I think when everybody's sick, we want medicine. Right? Like, it's like an Advil, a Tylenol, something. It's totally normal, right? That's why medicine exists. And that's not what we do when people have a problem with drugs. We say, we have this great medicine, but you're not really in recovery if you use it. We have this great medicine, and you're a loser if you use it. And then you go to peer support meetings with your, to get like wellness in the global community, and they say, well, you can't talk if you use this medicine. Yes. And then there's this great thing called naloxone, which has totally been co-opted, right? So the first people, naloxone has been around forever, right? Uh, you talk to like an anesthesiologist or a doctor, they're like, hey, you use naloxone in the ER, it's in the hospital, forever. And this crazy guy, Dan Big in Chicago, was like, we should take it out of the hospitals and start giving people who use drugs so they can save each other, right? And I could just imagine before my time, I just imagine like the local cops, like, you can't do that. Local pharmacy board is like, who does this guy think he is? Can't do that. This is our thing. I went to school for 27 years to be a pharmacist and a doctor. I control this medication. And then about five, six years ago, we passed along Pennsylvania to make it more accessible. And then what we do with that medication is not give it to the people that need it, people who are using drugs, who are likely to witness an overdose, we give it to cops. We spent $2.5 million last year on naloxone, and most of it's going to expire. I, I, I get Narcan all the time that falls off the bus. It just shows up at my house and I give to people that are gonna actually use drugs. Actually be able to save their friends. 
It's not that we don't know what to do. It's that we lack the political will to do it, right? This great program for Prevention Point Philadelphia. They give out like a gazillion emails. Uh, they're actually our fiscal sponsor for our organization, and I was on a grant application once. It was like, how many needles does your organization give out? I was like, 3.5 million. And the funder wrote back, like, is that the whole state? I was like, no, that's just in Philly. But actually, Philly should be giving away something like 11 million needles in a year to, to cut down the risk of HIV and hepatitis. Again, it's not that we don't know what to do. We lack the political will to make it happen. Right? And syringe service programs are a great example of a harm reduction intervention, right? And this is like a a Cadillac harm reduction program offers all these things, right? Uh, referral to substance use disorder treatment, referral to mental health treatment. We know that people that have a mental health concern or people that have substance use disorders, almost half of them also have a mental health concern. And sometimes we get somebody on some meds, they'll stop hearing those voices, stop feeling depressed, stop feeling anxious, and then we can get them engaged in substance use disorder treatment. But if we say you've got to stop using all drugs, well, the, voice, the drugs are the only thing that make the voices go away. This is not the only thing that makes you feel not anxious. And that's why these programs, these low threshold programs are so good. They refer people to treatment. They teach them how to use syringes in a safe way so they end up dead like my friend Charlie, right? Education, the walks on distribution, these very syringes off the, off the street. And here's the real funny thing. They give them all these services, all these things they need to be as safe as possible while they're making their main decisions to drug, and they say, no, she's going open the open that's what we have to do by subjection. You just gotta say, hey, here's everything you need and need and move here. It's the place where you raise drums. We're gonna be there to watch and watch your eye, your eye. If you wanna go to trigger, we got that up that upstairs or next door. That's how this is. It's not just against the black and black and egg of things. Let's share with Sean with our reduction. That's a good idea. Want to share and share with Sean with Adams, who's also a black man. The top, the top doctor, doctor of America, which is just my also, also supports certain service programs. No matter, no matter how uncomfortable certain service programs make up, they are treating the same lives, both by preventing the spread of disease like HIV and hepatitis C, by like connecting people to treatment that can put them on the pathway to recovery. It's not awesome. We need that. And again, let's just keep it going. Let's move up the chain of command, right? Alex Azar. Secretary of Health, United States of America, Republican. Syringe service programs aren't necessarily the first thing you think about with the no, first thing that comes to mind when you think about a Republican health secretary. We're in a battle between sickness and health, life and death. The CDC says 30 years with the research says syringe service programs are good. And again, I don't expect you to believe it because I say it. I've only got one terminal degree, not like three like most of you in here, but all these people think it's a good idea. And do you know that we've only got five counties with syringe service programs in Pennsylvania? So that means 10 million people that might need access to syringe service programs have no access to them. And actually, in those counties, it's actually only one city that has them in those counties, right? So Pittsburgh and Allegheny County, York, Lancaster, Harrisburg, and those counties in Philadelphia, which is the whole county. And across the state, across the nation, oh, timer done. All right, I'm going to be super quick. Across the country, it's not even ubiquitous. Pennsylvania and South Carolina are actually the only two states on the eastern seaboard which do not have authorization for statewide syringe service programs. Us in South Kakalaka haven't figured this out. Right? Fentanyl test strips, another great intervention for harm reduction. Let's people test whether or not there's fentanyl in their drug. And did you know that fentanyl test strips and needle exchange programs are illegal in the state of Pennsylvania because the controlled substances and uh, cosmetic act. Controlled substance drug device and cosmetic act, which just pretty much says anything that you use to inject drugs or you may use to inject drugs in the future is illegal. And it was designed by state legislators because cops kept saying, we're catching people who we know are drug users, we're not catching them with drugs. We're catching them with all this other stuff, we need to be able to arrest them. Peak drug war stuff. And they don't want to get rid of it. And so what I ask each one of you to do uh, is to advocate, get involved. You should go to our website, paharmreduction.org. Look at me, I wear the shirt that says, in the drug war. You gotta look good in suits and bow ties. You need to develop a relationship with your legislators. So you should go to our website, paharmreduction.org. You should follow us on social media. You should get involved. We're running around the state training people. And we could use some lawyers or some JD MPHs because uh, it's tough. It's Thanks.
All right, I totally failed as timekeeper. No, I was actually I let Nick go way too long. And then Evan, thank you for bringing me back. And so, but it's okay because our last hour is a group discussion. All right, so not all is lost. And there's so much rich stuff here. We are, you know, struggling with so much. And I told you that Devin is our go-to translation dissemination guy. I'm not going to say a word. I wrote copious notes. I'm going to open it right up. Um, there's five to six minutes left, but like I said, we're going to end with group discussion. So, yeah. So, who has questions, comments from this group? Michelle. Um, it's a question for Nick. Um, I don't, for a minute, dispute the premise that access to MAT is critical for dealing with the opioid epidemic, but you lead pretty quickly to the conclusion that it needs to be through Medicaid. And uh, in part because of all the pathological policy features of Medicaid these days, and in part because it introduces for state Medicaid administrators all kinds of really hard trade offs between am I going to spend money on this or am I going to spend money on? extra services for kids or hep C, why shouldn't we just provide states with block grants to administer these services outside of Medicaid? Why, why get well, actually, I, I don't I actually didn't say that, um, I don't think I mentioned Medicaid-assisted treatment, um, but merely Medicaid as giving access to care. Um, I firmly uh, believe in, in other insurers, um, you can go through the uh, very segmented coverages. Um, so if we have problems with Medicare, with what treatments it covers. Um, our biggest problem probably with private insurance and MAT uh, is uh, a narrow network problem. Um, most behavioral uh, network, most behavioral treatment providers are going to be out of network. Some really good, strong data on that. Um, I suppose to an extent what you're describing is the status quo in that although we haven't been calling them block grants, we've been calling them SAMHSA grants. And that with waves of federal legislation from uh, CARA 1, 2, Cure Support Act, we have just been sort of, you know, press recycle and, 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 and carry on cleaning. And we've been sending out grants, typically grants with uh, very low horizons, right? So you have to spend within a relatively short period. So they're actually worse than block grants, because at least you know the block grant is gonna come again next year. Well, unless you're chip, in which case you have to worry every three to five years. Um, but, um, uh, I think that's what we're doing, um, but I think it plays into this idea of um, opioid exceptionalism, right? And instead of mainstreaming this through the healthcare system and treating these disorders like any other chronic disease um, and having a, a continuum of care that is sensitive to that, I'm sorry? Integration. Integration, fully, a fully integrated model. Um, now, that's problematic because we haven't been able to do that properly despite several mental, mental health parity laws, right? So we're already behind that particular rock in our case. Um, but that's where I see the future, is, is that sort of integrated model. And block grants leave the decision-making And block grants are bad because Philly will spend it the right way. But uh, Wayne County, you know, rural counties, you know, we really need the smart people that have got the experience who are thinking about population health, making the decisions, contracting with local agencies. And in Pennsylvania, we don't even have a mechanism for that, right? In Pennsylvania, we have to contract from the state to the county. And the county has to contract with somebody when they may or may not even have a service provider in that region. You know, it's, I think their entire delivery of the money is also poor and broken. Yeah, I'm 
I was very concerned to hear about this uh, 20 years in prison because somebody dies uh, from a drug overdose. It's a, a friend of uh, a friend of yours. Um, and uh, I know there's two trends in policing, the International Association of Chiefs of Police, which is kind of status quo. On the other hand, there's Police Executive Research Foundation, which is for community policing and helping solve problems in the community. So to be balanced, I'm aware of that trend. I used to go to a lot of community meetings in New York with them. Also, having lived in New York in the 70s, I do remember Serpico. I do remember the Knapp Commission. Uh, and the, you know, a lot of the cops in New York City were running a protection racket uh, for drug dealers. And uh, uh, the NAP Commission supposedly did something about that. I think they did. But um, uh, when we talk about the cops um, uh, being the, the guardians of, of morality, I think we need to remember there's a lot of big money to be made in drugs. And I don't know if that's still a problem or not, police corruption, but it's something to be uh, aware of. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of money to be made in drugs on both sides. Uh, corruption actually is only a small kind of, you know, piece of the iceberg, which is that the money that's, I mean, if, if you, in Boston, where I work, uh, we are starting to look at the police budget and it's $400 million annually. And that's actually just the um, appropriations budget is probably closer to $700 million. Um, whereas if you look at the investment in other supportive system for mental health and substance use, which is what police spend most of the time dealing with, um, it's a small fraction. Um, you know, of course we do have systems of paying for those services through insurance and other means, but, but it just shows you where the priorities are. And if we're talking about, um, you know, shifting in an approach to substance use specifically, um, you have to follow the money and put, you know, put your money where your mouth is. And that's just not, that's not the case. And that's also true on the federal level, on the state level. So, so, and, and this is where the danger in, and this goes back to Devin's point, which is the block grants, um, they kind of, there's a path dependence in the sense that the money flows to those who have power on the state level and, and the block grants allow those kinds of paths to continue to, to, you know, expand. And so if the powerful industry in substance use treatment in this, each state, which is actually the case, is a lot of the kinds of treatment providers that Dylan was talking about, people who do not follow the science and, you know, programs that are actually abusive, and I use this abusive in a, a very deliberate way, um, those are the people who are going to be getting a lot of the block grants and a lot of the, the funding. And that's what's happened, unfortunately, in a lot of states with opioid money coming down the pike, having to be spent very quickly. Many states have basically invested in programs that make patients um, not better off and in a lot of cases worse off. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So as a Philadelphian who loved both your presentations and the injection site and everything you guys talked about is so relevant to how Philadelphians in every neighborhood, I think, live to a certain degree, what would you suggest in terms of advocating to like, your neighbors or your friends? Is it just giving people more information that we learn through your programs or people are super scared of a lot of these things and don't really have tons of knowledge of them? Uh well, so thank you for wanting to share some information. That's always a good first step. You know, we have been trying to recruit folks to talk to their friends, their families, their neighbors, and that, um, you know, we come into a community meeting in, in Kensington and 200 people yell at us for an hour and 45 minutes. But I do think that there is an opportunity for kind of the house party model. Like back when we used to talk about talking about HIV, you know, I understand the neighbors may be concerned about what it all means, but let us explain what the research shows. Let us explain why you saw that, that cartoon. There's supervised injection happening all the time, but people are, you know, it's the kids who are walking to school who are watching it, you know. We can address those concerns. You don't want people being on the street, we can address that. You don't want litter, drug-related litter on the street, we can address that. And so we would absolutely welcome the opportunity to present at small groups. 
I mean, you know, we've talked to lots of lawyers, you know, good liberal lawyers who are saying things like, so you're giving out heroin? Like, no, no, we're not actually giving out heroin. So to the extent you want to be in touch with us and hook us up with any collection of people who want to hear what we're talking about, that would be great. So what I think I'm hearing you say is that you want to make a difference. Okay, fabulous. What I tell everybody who's a professional is sign up to give five, ten dollars a month to an organization that's going to work. Right? Money is hard to come by. Nobody wants to give them money. Nobody wants to give us money. Give money. <laughs> Number two, throw a beef and beer. Right? Throw like we're gonna have a barbecue at my house. Everybody throws in twenty bucks. And then at that event, not only are you raising money, then you have an opportunity to talk. And there's a whole bunch of us that will come out. Like I'm here. Ron is here. Sterling's here. You know, a whole bunch of us know about the, you need, you know, the smart guy, Evan will come out. You know what I mean? Uh, there's a whole, mean by that? well, I mean, you know, I, guess, I, mean, I don't know. He's the, the academic is what I meant. Right. Uh, we are smart. I'm sorry. But yeah. But, um, yeah, we need, we need a movement, right? It's not about safe house. It's not about needle exchange programs. It's the fact that the police and the politicians have all the power and we have through apathy, given it to them in the response to behavioral health and substance use disorder, and we need soldiers just like you. So please follow. Yeah. Straight up Philly grassroots. Yeah. So, um, and just one second. Sterling in the house. Great to see you, Sterling. Also one of our very first lawyers at the, the Center for Public Health Law Research. Who's next? Yes. I'm sure you heard this before and have a planned response that uh, insulin guys can't get the drug. And the second is uh, the pharma thing. These guys are getting fined, uh, you know, a couple billion dollars, but nobody's going to jail. Right. So uh, as far as the, he was referencing a meme, like, why is it that I can't afford my insulin, but this person who uses drugs gets Narcan for free? Number one, I stand in solidarity with the person that cannot get their insulin, right? Uh, much of what we're talking about is an access to healthcare issue, right? So when we're thinking about presidential debates. I don't think Bernie is like super sharp on drug policy like some other people, but on the back of access to healthcare, you just might get my vote, right? If you can't get well, if you can't get access to health, whether that wellness is from diabetes or substance use disorder. Uh, and then to your second question, you know what? My father was a victim of the war on drugs and the Sackler family wasn't making uh, opiate, the opioids then. The U.S. government government is the number one purveyor of death and horror with the war on drugs, both domestically and internationally. And sure, do they pay something in it? But much of this law uh, suit is about the absolving of the local district attorneys, the local legislators to say it was them, it wasn't us. It's not that we refused to legalize Narcan five years ago instead of four. It wasn't because we didn't opt into Medicaid, like my colleague to the right said. It wasn't that we continued to lock up bracket black and brown people at high rates. Um, it wasn't us. It was the Sackler thing. That's just not true. There's plenty of guilt to go around, and I don't think $7 billion worth three years is nearly enough. They should go to jail. I got a friend that's doing 20 years in jail for sharing a bag of dope with a friend, and these guys killed how many people and none of them going to jail? That's some white privilege right there. Scott. This is going to ramble a little bit, but because I, I can't quite figure out the right way to ask this question, maybe because it's too big and some of it has to do with prediction and some of it has to do with uncertainty and confusion. But I sort of, I have never, I can't think of another policy that has been in place, another law that has been in effect for half a century that has a, a, a worse, plainly worse record than the controlled substances. Um, on the one hand, the, there's really good evidence of all the harm that it's done, of, of, of a war on drugs approach, or prohibition approach. There's lots of collateral damage. That's, I think, really well documented, and people are, you know, I think more aware of that. But I, I still find myself in polite circles where the I, you know, where, where where people don't just haven't got it in their heads that that we have never actually controlled substances. 
school. Um, you know, there, there's, there's sort of less research. I mean, I tried to put a comment in public health reports for Abbott Collins um, that, 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 that alluded to, in fact, it's talking about safe house, but it alluded to the argument, you know, that, that we have to prevent safe house because that would undermine control of drugs. But of course, as, as Ron has pointed out, we have all these deaths because there's no control over the flow of street drugs. And in fact, the price purity ratio of heroin by, by DEA's own report has gotten better and better, that is to say, cheaper and purer, um, ev pretty much steadily ever since 1973. Like, and and we're not even talking about then the whole immigration crisis and destabilization of the country. I mean, it's like you could not have a worse policy. And yet, the people at public health reports who are people from CDC and other circuits, they said, oh, you can't make a claim like that. You can't say that in an article that the war on drugs hasn't worked. And leave aside the, the, you know, the battle of citation or something like that. I mean, it seems it, it's quite common for me. I mean, I, I'm not interested in people in this room. Like, is it your sense that, well, you know, there's some tinkering around the edges, we'd like to incarcerate fewer people. I mean, but how many people here actually have a sense that we have completely failed in drug control. So, you know, this is something we can argue about or talk about, but and then of course it's also true on the legal side. Because if you talk about the Sacklers um, as convenient scapegoats, who I mean, it's convenient because they actually probably deserve a lot of condemnation, the, the DEA was supine throughout this. I mean, the ARCOS data should tell the DEA where every bill has been. And, and, well, they did nothing about it. I mean, state, a lot, it was a lot of state law work that shut down filming. Shut down filming. You know, that was all information available to the EA. Um, you know, so the FDA, you know, in approving the, the, the label for Oxycontin, you know, I mean, on, on no evidence, was, was asleep at the wheel um, at the time. And then, so, so my point being is this is just like a catastrophic failure. And, Yet that doesn't seem to be public information. So you wonder as researchers what you should be doing, as, as people in the community what you should be doing, to, like, to, 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 to sort of comprehend, to create a, an abyssin like sense of the failure of, of, of drug policy, in spite of books like The New Jim Crow, in spite of books like Medland, that just doesn't, that just doesn't penetrate as far as I can tell. And I'm just worried if you guys have people here that can react like, what does it take for people to say, you know, I can Maybe we have substantial. Yeah, I, I mean, just to jump in real quick, I, I don't think that most white people are going to understand the racist nature of the war on drugs until their daughter marries a black guy and they have a black grandkid that's a young man and they think about, holy shit, my 16 year old kid is going out and I'm worried what's going to happen to that. You know, uh, when Mayor de Blasio talks about, I raised two black kids, I know what this shit means. He don't know like I know. He's got a better sense than most white people do. You know, we are tribal by nature. You know, we like, oh, he's from my neighborhood. He plays on my sports team. I like him. But, you know, we got to be collective. We got to be part of the movement. As, as long as it seems as an over there thing, at least for that last point that you hit, I don't think that we're going to get there. You know, I mean, we're trying to inspire. We're trying to build a movement. But it's, you know, we got some way to go. I want to show you something. Oh, sorry. Cool. Um, you know, I think that the strong reaction from the Department of Justice to Safe House and to the notion of supervised consumption starts to be a first uh, hit on the foundation of the drug war, right? If they admit that, that you need to do something different and allow supervised consumption, they are somewhere in their minds conceding the fact that it's all been a failure. And so they're holding tight on this. I mean, the, it's not a coincidence that the U.S. attorney from Massachusetts had an editorial that we heard come out of the lips of the U.S. attorney in Pennsylvania. They've got a script. They're holding on to the end to say, because having to admit the failure is something that nobody's willing to do. And, and just to add to that, I think, uh, Rhonda, uh, it was interesting that you framed the civil suit as a positive. In my mind, it is actually an indicator that the, the U.S. attorney chose to take a much more soft approach. And I think that is an indicator that they're actually concerned. 
that, that if they file criminal charges, that that would paint them in the light that is actually accurate. And the fact that they took the soft approach um, is, it, you know, again, an indicator that, that they're scared. But, but to Scott's point, I think, um, you know, for, I totally agree that the Controlled Substances Act fails on both sides of the legal versus illegal divide. And in fact, the legal illegal distinction clearly makes no sense where, you know, we have opioids on one side that are legal, we have their chemical cousins that are completely illegal, they're scheduled in a way that there is no, no rational, there's no rhyme or reason why they can get, you know, heroin and, and cannabis are scheduled one of one of their substances. That's absolutely true. Pharmaceutical companies came in and said, well, you, you know, we're going to stop you from shutting stuff down. And now they're like, oh, well, we want us to do something in 2014, and um, they wouldn't let us. Well, that's total BS because from to about 1995, the rates of, you know, the quotas were going up double digits every year. Where were they then, right? Um, and then on the, on this, you know, and then once the, the crisis gathered steam, their interventions actually made it worse. And that's where we are today, and they're continuing to do that. And so I think that at the 50th anniversary of the Controlled Substances Act, which is um, coming up, uh, you know, it's a, it's a moment of reflection of how is this edifice of drug control working for us? And it's not. And I think that we should re-envision what it means to, you know, provide access for medical, scientific, and pleasure purposes while also maintaining uh, a kind of regulation that minimizes harms. So I don't think we've had that conversation. Yeah, and well, and you're up next, so yeah, so you might as well come on up anyway. I mean, I, I was like, this is all so depressing on one on hand. On the other hand, um, we have managed to draw Arnold Ventures and Chain Zuckerberg Initiative and, you know, like with the profile raising the money, um, there's some pretty cool things happening despite the fact that we haven't been able to move the needle on some of these more depressing um, issues. And on that note, I'll hand this off to Jones. I think there's so much more to say here. So, so Leo, I'm going to put you on the spot, and Evan, I'm going to put you on the spot just to follow up with, with exactly what you were saying. I think one of the themes that keeps coming up over the course of the day is exactly what you hit on your presentation, the narrative and the communication um, and the story that's being told. So to follow up on your point, how do we shift that narrative? And Evan, to you, you talked on this idea of making the financial argument basically flipping it on its head. So how do we do a better job of getting that mode of communication out because the other thing I keep thinking of as we keep talking about harm reduction the, the work that I'm interested in is in tobacco and right now when you say e-cigarettes and harm reduction it's a it's that's a, a non-starter so how do we reframe that in such a way that it is palatable to policymakers it is accessible by the general public in a way that you know Evan your point about the chair like that couldn't have been any more poignant how do you make that point other than putting it out on social media. So both of you, if you want to comment. Um, well, I, I think it's a, it's a pretty broad question. I think that there are, you can break it down into smaller elements. And one of those elements for us in our work is um, how media portrays these issues. And we're, you know, in creating Changing the Narrative, that website, we're also, we have an outreach effort that actually tries to do detailing with editors and with journalists that um, you know tracks language uses analytical tools to track language that is you know things like addicted babies or the word substance abuse 
you know, things that are just patently uh, wrongheaded and tries to sort of educate reporters, but also, and I think this is important, I'm gonna hand it off to Devin, elevating the voices of people who know what they're talking about and people with lived experience because the folks who have been front, um, forefronted as experts on drug policy have been cops and prosecutors. And so they, you know, invariably will serve their own vested interest in, you know, again, net widening and talking about um, sort of the, and, and, you know, not to minimize there's, you know, a wonderful work being done um, in some corners in mental health and domestic violence and, and even opioid response. But if you're talking to a police officer about fentanyl, you end up with the current situation where the narrative around the fact that you can overdose by touching fentanyl or breathing it becomes a public policy priority. And there's now money being allocated to a non-existent threat. And policies like drug-induced homicide are being propelled by that non-existent threat because law enforcement is coming into state legislatures and saying, you know, this is a threat to law enforcement because when we come to an overdose scene, we're gonna overdose and die. That threat is non-existent, but, and there's no evidence behind it. And this is maybe comes back to the, to the evidence discussion. There's plenty of evidence and every scientific body has now issued a statement saying, you can't overdose on fentanyl by touching it. You can't overdose on fentanyl by breathing it in. And yet this is now a public policy priority um, and is being uh, propagated. So I guess what I'm saying is it's really important to elevate the voices of people who have expertise and people with lived experience, just like Devin was saying, ask people what they need, meet people where they're at. Real quick, so, yeah. So this e syrup thing is a perfect example of shitty drug policy. So we knew there was an outbreak of bad cartridges that were mostly cannabis, right? And we didn't say that for two months. We said vapes are bad, right? And like my, my grandma's calling me, like, are you vaping still? I'm like, don't worry, Grandma. I picked up Newports. How's that make you feel? Well, you should just quit altogether. And then we find out that it was cannabis-related vapes, which is a result of the prohibition of cannabis, right? And now what we're seeing is politicians in New Jersey and in Washington saying, we should ban flavored vapes, which is only going to lead me to go back to smoking Newports. So the problem was the prohibition. So we're going to kill the legal vape industry. We're going to push more people back to tar-based nicotine which is cigarettes and we're gonna and we're gonna kill people like so problem a well forget that we're not gonna we're so married to Canada's prohibition let's kill something else i mean that's drug policy in pennsylvania or in america in a nutshell can i, can I push back a little bit on please because i mean there's another yes. dimension to this story of and this is actually the sort of legal empty problem right i mean there's a huge regulatory design issue looking at us in the face because we have had some success in, 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 in getting the dissatisfaction with prohibition to become law, and that's legal cannabis, right? Um, although, in fact, this is probably not what it is. It's probably not really that people didn't like prohibition, it's that they like marijuana. I mean, you got enough people to feel comfortable with marijuana, they didn't want it to be illegal anymore. But now you have this situation where there's, you know, all that huge money that used to be made illegally in a hidden corporate form is now poised to be made legally in an explicit corporate form. Um, and the, the, the idea that it's all, I mean, it's clearly you already see much more powerful formulations, um, you know, there's there, and we don't really control that or regulate that much, um, the, the much greater ease of access um, and access in multiple forms and access in forms that kids can easily get at and use in school and all sorts of stuff. I mean, I, as a public health person, I'm not for drugs, although I think pleasure is an important virtue that we should not you know, neglect when we think about drug policy. Uh, I'm against policies that add to the harm instead of reducing it. But we have a huge challenge. If we're serious about prohibition, it can't be prohibition in which Philip Morris goes into the heroin business. Um, and so, you know, and, 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 and the vaping is, I mean, Juul has been a completely irresponsible entity. There is no question that it sees its market as being getting kids to smoke flavored stuff. So the benefits of harm reduction for alcohol or for, for tobacco are not supposed to be 
well, first we'll we'll have them, you know, get them hooked young. Then they can smoke cigarettes. Then we can hook them again. It was supposed to be that people who were long-term cigarette users could switch. Right. And now, you know, so, but this is, well, I, I mean, I'm fully with you on panic-based regulation, particularly around drugs. I mean, I think the, 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 the frustrating thing here is that we have a huge public health regulatory problem, which is drugs. And that includes the legal and the illegal drugs. And we have a bunch of sort of proven tools and proven approaches, which largely have to do with manipulating price and access um, to reduce consumption. But implementing those is a huge political battle against powerful corporations. And it's as if the, the corporate side is getting the enforcement now. You know, they're gonna have the marijuana reinforcement, so the, it'll be the alcohol and marijuana. And if we go any further with other drugs, it's gonna be the alcohol, heroin, marijuana, tobacco stuff. And, and you know, so again, I, I, I kinda, the, the good thing on our side is that we actually can think of constructing reasonably good regulatory systems based reason, and, and reasonably plausible to work based on past evidence. But, um, you know, we're facing not just the mess of of the, and the predictable problem of corporate pushback, but the fact that the, the sort of story, we, we don't have a consistent national understanding mm -hmm. of the drug problem. Half of it's racism, you know, so you got that in there. Um, half of it is, you know, whatever drug I use is obviously harmless, and whatever drug you use is a, is a scourge. Then there is the fact that, that, you know, lots of people are experiencing the horrors of, of, of substance use mm -hmm. dependency and what it, what it can do to people. And they think that's the typical, you know, user of whatever drug caused it. Um, I, you know, we, 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 I don't know what, what this means. You, you, you work in the health system, so you tell us how we take on a complicated problem. Like that. <laughs> well, we won't have any money because you're going to be picking our pocket for public health, isn't you? Blame the Pentagon. Blame it. We just we didn't have the energy. <laughs> I do want to go back to Evan, though, because I do want you to touch on the, the economic part of it as well. Um, okay. I, th I think, and I'll also maybe respond a little bit to, to Scott's question. Um, I worry that we won't be able to make any durable change in schooling the, the drug war if we don't quote, provide replacement public health services. So we've flirted with drug control reform in the past. And with deinstitutionalization is another, it's not a perfect analogy, but it is an analogy. Um, it's, it's very easy to see many of the faults with policing and, and not also acknowledge that there are on, you know, one and a half million calls for service each year in Philadelphia. And we really do need to address security and we really do need to support communities. We don't bring the public health services in scale and in depth breath, then changes that we <laughs> make to criminal laws vis-a-vis -vis drug policy, I think will just, they'll, they just won't be durable. They won't have their effect and we'll just find another way to criminalize the same sorts of problems through another, through another regime. That was uplifting. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I have a public health story. That's the most obvious point. You, you're right. And, and there's always been this, um, you know, kind of half-baked decriminalization or deinstitutionalization where you divest from one system and then don't invest in another. And I think that, that those lessons have to be learned. But it is also true that, um, you know, whenever there is a conversation about resources, um, the assumption, you know, there's been kind of this um, prioritization of the security apparatus and all of the, you know, we see that on the, like the national budget for, Defense, for example, is absolutely obscene. So that's the same. It percolates all the way down. So I think, <laughs> yeah. So I think that's you know that has to be part of the conversation. I also think that um, if we stay true to our market economy, at some point, return on investment arguments are going to break through. Mm -hmm. um, they're out there in harm reduction. I don't think we make enough play about investing in harm reduction and other aspects of the crisis. Um, we both were in Ohio, weren't we, Leo? Uh, Ohio State, around the time when 
proposition. It wasn't a proposition, was it? It was something option one, option one or proposal one or whatever it was, which which went down in flames. But they were they were mighty impressive flames. Um, and the idea was to Nick, for the audience, can you just say what that was? Um, it was the, the proposal was essentially a decrim, a, a sort of a mild decrim um, of drug offences. And then using the money that would have been used for incarceration, for treatment mm -hmm. um, and education. And eventually, I think some argument like that is going to break through. I just don't know when. Well, and who could have benefited from it? I know everybody up here has been talking a lot. Yeah, exactly. I wanted to make sure that we get an opportunity for folks in the audience. This is your opportunity to ask questions, to make comments. Sure. sure. Go ahead, Mindy. Thank you. This has been a great conversation. Um, Scott's bringing these cigarettes into this, though. Really, I think for me, spark the question. I really wanted to ask you, Deb, as you're running to the back there, which is, you know, the conversation about harm reduction. I think sometimes overlooks the what with e-cigarettes, you know, there are two different populations, right? There is the population of users on right on in and who we're trying to, you know, uh, keep from harm. But there is also the population of might be, could be, might not be users someday in the future, mm -hmm. right? And with any of these, whether we're talking about cigarettes um, or whether we're talking about heroin or, right, better not to use than to use all the, right? The, you, know, you know, nobody would say to their kid, we'd love you to start using heroin, right? So I guess my question is, I, I would like, we know that what we're doing now and the criminal justice approach isn't working and it certainly isn't stopping people so from using. But what is the approach and how do we do research, not for the harm reduction part, but for the reduction in uptake, you know, in the future? I mean, you know, so we think about messages that parents give their kids. We know that don't do drugs doesn't work, right? That's a shitty mm -hmm. idea. What we should say is, baby, I love you. And if anything's going on in your life where you feel like you need outside substance to deal with it, I want to let you know you can talk to your friends, you can play video games, you can run around, you can talk to a therapist. Now, if none of those seem viable and you want to use drugs, I want to let you know, here's the information to use drugs in the safest way possible. Never mix alcohol and pills. Never drink a whole bunch of alcohol in a short period of time because those aren't the messages that are getting out. Go ahead. You can't describe, I mean, yes. that's, that's the approach to the parent, right. to the kid individually. Right. I'm asking a somewhat different question. Okay. We're talking about public policy. Sure. The research. And we're talking about what we're doing at a community level. Right. And so I'm not, you know, not putting it on the parents. Right. But schools right? should be saying this too. A lot of parents, too. a lot of people end up, you know, using the, those conversations aren't always going to happen, right? right? And a lot of kids don't come from homes where they have good relations with their parents. And it would be great if everybody did, but everybody doesn't. So I guess I'm asking, what is, we're talking law, we're talking policy, what are the laws and policies to prevent uptake as opposed to the laws and policies to reduce harm? Sure. Like universal okay. income. Yeah. Well, that, I, I mean, you know what I mean? Like, that's the reason people use drugs, because they don't have enough, there's not enough resources, there's no social workers in the schools. I mean, when we talk about prevention programs, I'm like, I don't really know what you're talking about, because those all seem like shallow to me. Stop intergenerational poverty, stop intergenerational trauma. If those big answers don't sound great, I mean, that's why I wore the end the drug war shirt to this thing, because that's the real goal and everything else we're doing is bullshit or a small step along that way. And that's the measure of success, right? Like, uh, if we're going towards ending the war on drugs, then it's a cool intervention. If it's something that sounds good, but doesn't go in that direction, it makes the police state larger, and I don't really support that. So if you want real prevention, let's come up with laws that make poverty, intergenerational trauma, and the reasons people use drugs go away. Well, so, so that's, that's kind of taking us to the large, you know, back to the earlier session, the like social determinant right. session. And I was just kind of wondering, maybe Jennifer, if you're listening to this, you know, you have like 130 policies in that index. 
and you know, we we heard from from you know Kelly about um, earned income tax credit and minimum wage. I mean, so right away you're talking about those things. They were talking there about stuff that has an impact on birth weight, which is like the early, you know, but we're thinking of life course. Like we know that it's really the common, it's the things that happen to you before you're born, right up to the point that you die. So um, we could just say, well, the rate of substance use in a society is a symptom of social conditions, um, not of, you know, individual, particularly of individual choice or individual population level. So what, what are the kinds of social, what are the kinds of most plausible interventions the things, you know, do you have a sense of your 132 policies of where you'd start? You have a knack for asking really big questions today. <laughs> um, there I are some guess. policies that do pop up time and time again in our work as being particularly important and important across the entire lifespan. So important for infants, you know, young adults and older adults. Policies like EITC. Mm -hmm. and um, other economic policies that reduce income inequality. Those seem to be particularly important for um, all kinds of health and mortality measures. Um, but there are other kinds of policies. One of the measures that pops up, and I'm going to try to answer this in a backwards way, one of the, the indicators um, of a state or of a county that always turns up to be a very strong predictor of the health and mortality of that county is a measure of social connectedness. So I find that really frustrating. I mean, on one hand, it makes a lot of sense. So areas where you don't know your neighbors, you don't trust your neighbors, you're socially isolated, um, there's a lot of, you know, disconnection. Those are the areas where we see really high rates um, of you know, death and despair and other kinds of adverse outcomes. But what do you do about that? So, you know, I'd, I'd much rather of all of these indicators that I have, you know, that there's one very concrete and I could go turn a lever and say, just do this and everything will be fine. I don't know what you do about increasing social connectedness, but if there were such policies, I would think that would be a really good place to start. But I think that raises the point that sometimes it's not always policies that are the <clears throat> that are solutions. Sometimes it's programs. Sometimes it's system level interventions. Um, and the other thing too that, and Wendy, this goes back a little bit to your point. When we're talking about legal epidemiology, we're, we're talking one piece of it is the the mapping, but the other piece that we didn't get into as much today is understanding the mechanisms. And so mapping is great, but without understanding those more complex mechanisms, understanding the upstream reasons why we've got kids who are turning to an assortment of substance use. Sometimes that's the harder question, but that's really the important question. Um, and I think your point about social connectedness, that, that, that's a great piece. And so is that something that we can be looking at intervening? And maybe we don't have the policy solutions, but that's where we start working more in terms of interprofessional opportunities that are we partnering with other individuals? Are we, where'd Leo go? Are we working on narratives that get to that point and saying policy solutions aren't the only thing? We could throw lots of policies out there, but Number one, if we're not evaluating them. Number two, if we don't understand the mechanisms for change, you know, we could we could throw policies all day long and it would be useless. So, good point. Other points or questions? Comments? Big ideas? We've, we've tackled some really big issues today. So, uh, I was not here for most of this. Uh, but I, I am interested in, uh, I think it was, it was brought up about uh, connecting to people with lived experience and, and um, you know, and, and thinking about how they can be integrated into research, um, how they can be, you know, part of delivering, you know, research questions and, and, and kind of figuring out solutions that are working for grassroots organizations. And, you know, some of those ideas. I'm just wondering if um, if the people in the room can just talk about their experience with that. Uh, um, I know I have experience in some some failures and, and some some successes, especially because it, it's not always clear uh, what the answer is from, from individuals that, that don't have the level of knowledge that we have in this room. So um, it, it'd be just interesting to hear about people's experiences. And even when it comes to coding or, or reading laws, you know, having late people read laws is, is a, a it's, I would say difficult. <laughs> so, 
So we're we'll talking more about community-based engagement, community collaboration, community-based participation in research. Yes, anything yes. related to that. I'll open it up. I think. What is it that you're looking to code, and what are the implications of coding in different ways? So, I'm just having Scott any or any of the, the those lawyers at KHLR comments. It's not always a lot of research dollars have flown in the direction of, of, of opioids. I'm not convinced that that's always been a good thing or helpful. And I think sometimes the way that research has been conducted has actually been harmful and alienated communities. And I think we, we really need to be more introspective as a research community about that. Think about structural ways to, to address that, including if you're going to do community-based research, you should, you, know, you should yield the first and the last author position maybe to people in the community if you're delivering those services. Because um, I think we have real problems and you can see it in a place like Philadelphia where everyone is elbowing the same space. Mm -hmm. and that creates, I think, problems for, for moving forward in good faith. I think that's, you've got a point in terms of the elbowing, both in terms of researchers in a small vicinity, but also the agencies that are working to address these problems. I think one of the ways that we that, that has come out of the work of PHLR and thinking about, another thing that came out of our, of our, of our, of our years with RWJF was, and with collaborating across CDC and the other public health law programs and network was this idea we talk about the, the five essential public health law services, which is a very wonky thing and it's intentionally so because it's geared towards a, a portion of public health practice which is geared around defining the 10 essential public health services. Um, and, and those in turn arose in the, in the 80s um, when public health was accused of being in disarray, not knowing what it was doing, not knowing whether it was doing whatever it was doing well, et cetera. And so they said, you better define the services you deliver. And then that became the basis for continuous public health improvement and service, uh, service management and eventually for the accreditation system. That's the latest effort to um, help public health agencies do better. So we said, well, we should do the same thing for law. But when we decided to figure, well, what are the sort of essential things that have to happen in, in the public health system for law to be an important feature? Um, we realized two things. One is that when you're really talking about things that are beyond sort of what lawyers normally do. Um, it's not just about drafting a law or having legal expertise. It's actually about coming up with, figuring out what you ought to use law to do. Um, it's about advocacy and, and enacting laws. It's about implementing and, and, and defending laws against challenges. And it's about evaluation. And if you put all those services, as we call them together, you realize, well, actually, lawyers are not the only ones doing that. Mm -hmm. um, we ought to think of public health law, and I think this is probably true of most settings and most things, we ought to think of it as a transdisciplinary um, activity, um, which means that, for example, if, if part of doing good public health law work is to actually mobilize and advocate to get a good idea passed, well, obviously, that's not something that's going to be led by the professionals or the lawyers. Necessarily. There are people who know how to do that, and there are people who have big stakes in that who want to be part of it and want to drive that. Um, you know, if you want to think about what are the right things to use law for, well, you can't just, I mean, you know, every now and then there are technical things. Like we know seatbelt laws work. That's a pretty good thing. Seatbelt laws probably don't have to have a whole lot of community meetings about seatbelt laws. But if you're talking about what to do about drug use in Kensington, you know, um, there's just a lot of experience that you need to enlist before you're even going to get close to properly defining the problem. It won't just be epidemiological or social and behavioral science knowledge, it's going to be lived experience of people, and you have to have those people at the table. And so I think partly it's, you know, one of the important things I think we want to do is recognize that um, you, you don't get knowledge because of where you went to school or what your job is. Um, and even if you got a lot of knowledge in those areas, you didn't get all the knowledge. 
Um, and if the goal is to be, if the goal is to be right and to be effective, then it's a team effort, um, a team of equals, a team of collaborators, um, and a team of people who listen to each other. Um, and, and, and so, you know, I don't know how we do the work that we want to do in, in, in public health law without that kind of community involvement at, at pretty much every step. Mike's coming back your way. First of all, I'm an outsider and I learned an awful lot. I thought it's an excellent presentation today. Um, one of the things that I didn't hear though was things affecting the children. The law is the law for adults and for children. But would the answers essentially be the same if children were involved in the effects in the school, et cetera? Maybe that's for a different slide. I don't know. But my thought was that it's all for children. So we can have different responses, but the answer to a number of things would be more important. Which point, which point, I mean, drug in particular or across other areas? Well, what I'm thinking about is we've discussed the situations as it affects uh, the law and as it affects adults in the court. Now, the children come into the court, but there's different uh, sense of purpose. The discussions that we had today also apply to children, there would be an overlay So I think I would say it, it depends on, on what it is. And, and then Nick, if you want, we'll get you the mic. I think it depends on what it is you're talking about. When we started touching on the idea of tobacco, you know, that is an area where we are impacting children. It depends on how you're defining children, but when we have the conversations about t tobacco to 21, when you're looking, you may be talking about a policy about increasing the minimum age to purchase, but that does have an effect on younger children. When you start thinking about how, what is the age for them to legally purchase, and then how far upstream are they attempting to purchase? So I think that gets back to this point of thinking about the mechanisms. And so if you're talking about implementing a policy what is it that you're trying to do? What are those unintended consequences, good or bad? But I do think even if children aren't the direct targets of the law or policy we're talking about, they are being impacted. Nick, if you want to add to it? I don't think I, I have the answer to your question, but I think it, it, it illustrates part of the problem we're having in that one of the great, um, most unheard groups who are suffering because of um, opioid use mm -hmm. are the NAS babies, the mm -hmm. neonatal abstinence syndrome babies. And they, their problems or any solutions for them have very much been flying under the radar. And I, I suspect it's because they don't fit into sort of the blameworthy category, right? Mm -hmm. It's, it's, uh, the cute it, babies. it's, they're cute babies. Where's the moral defect? Um, we really only want to talk about people that we can blame or have moral defect. Mm -hmm. So moral defect, go to jail, blameworthiness, will will take some money from the sacraments. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the NAS babies are a really interesting question. If they were had a much higher profile, you might get some some quite different uh, solutions and and, and so on. Uh, 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 Which I think speaks to the way that you're going to frame the how you're going to frame the policy. But I think you get. You were talking about, you know, the, the NAS babies, but I think even when you start talking about opioids, even looking at social services and what are the impacts for kids who are then removed from the home and now they're in foster care or living with another uh, family member, there, there's a whole implication there that those children are being affected. The, the policy wasn't intended directly at them. It's not targeting them, but they're absolutely being impacted in, in this case, in a negative way. Right, and this, there's some good arguments, for example, for child services to extend the time mm -hmm. before they, they, they intervene at trial mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and remove the children. But there should be a, a, a broader period in which the, the family can try and reassert itself. And, and 
rebuild its sort of internal social capital. Mm -hmm. right? Whereas I think we've been talking generally about social capital and how we need to to, to rebuild that. Yeah, at the more at the more local level. Yeah. Lindsay, you had a point. <clears throat> Thing really quick because I think that that's an interesting point that children only come out tangentially in the conversation. When Katie was speaking of housing, you can think of asthma, and when children are born, there's layers of laws that come into play right away. So Kelly's conversation on EITC and what that does to birth weight. And the one thing I wanted to add to that conversation is that the methods themselves that we're talking about today, legal epidemiology can apply to all laws. So laws that are specifically geared towards children, like national school lunch programs and um, late starts and breakfast programs, um, anti-bullying anti mm -hmm. and school discipline and zero tolerance policies. And we do a lot of, a lot of those um, domains within our organization. Um, so I wanted to just add that to the, the overall conversation. To the point, thank you. So I just want to give an example of something I think taxes on law, uh, taxes, housing, and racism. It was just a personal example. I had a house for my late wife in Mount Airy, and we wanted to get a loan uh, to do some uh, home improvements. And uh, my house was like one house away from the Chestnut Hill zip code, 19118. We were in 19119. And uh, to get a loan, our house had to be at a certain value. So the Wells Fargo did comparables, and they said, oh, your house isn't uh, worth enough for us to give you a loan. They said, can I see your comparables? And they had done comparables from Germantown, which is, was mainly black, two miles away. But no, there was not a single comparable from Chestnut Hill, which was one house away. And the reason, for that, the reason for that is because the bank comparables were done on the basis of zip codes. And zip codes are based on segregated neighborhoods. And there was a, there's a whole history of redlining neighborhoods where black families especially cannot get loans in their zip codes and then they can't fix their houses. In. So this is something that happened to me just because I was in a integrated neighborhood. So my, my uh, point is there should be banking regulations uh, 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 which I didn't hear discussed in terms of, of housing because of the history of discriminatory lending from banks and there's a history of purposeful segregation in the United States which the U.S. government uh, 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 actually fostered uh, in uh, uh, redlining. I can't remember the name of my uh, citation for that but I know I, I read some articles about bank collaboration with the government on the issue of red line. I was going to hold up a $5 bill before and say, hey, how many people have ever gotten a, 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 some money from the Federal Reserve Bank? Nobody in here has gotten a $5 or $100, any bill from the Federal Reserve Bank. How do we get this money? The Mint prints it up. It goes to the Federal Reserve Bank at 1.5, uh, or it goes, it gets shipped to the Federal Reserve Bank, and then the money is loaned out to private banks that the prime rate, less than 2%, which then charges 8 uh, to 10% for a home mortgage interest and charges up to 26% on credit cards. So I think an area where the law could come into play would be uh, banking regulation because the banks were deregulated in the 90s. I forget the name of the act that was overturned. But uh, I think that, that could solve a lot of uh, financial uh, and social issues if there was a little more attention to banking regulations. And I think that's a good example of what we talk about in terms of incidental public health law, that that in and of itself is not something that's targeting health, but I'm um, certainly, you know, you can imagine where not being able to, to access loans to be able to do basic home improvement as to, you know, negative health effects for the individuals in that home. Thank you. Another question here? Uh, I just want to offer a little different perspective. I'm, I'm a physician, actually, uh, and struggled with a substance use disorder for many years. Um, Thank I you for sharing was, that. I also was prosecuted under the Controlled Substance Act. And uh, Jennifer alluded to 
the solution, which was the solution for me, and that was connection, not just myself, but to the community. Um, and that was that was the solution. I, I think we need to create laws. We need to create an environment where people are able to connect, um, because the way it exists now, people are in hiding. And in the professional community, like a professional community, like a medical community, the legal community, people are scared. They're scared to lose their licenses. They're scared they're going to get arrested. Um, and if we don't create environments where people can speak openly without judgment, without stigma, mm -hmm. there is no way we're going to move forward. Um, you know, 90% 90, 90 of people with a substance use disorder don't get treatment. They don't get treatment. And uh, if we don't use harm reduction strategies and educate people on safe use and have open conversations, people will die. People will continue to die. And, uh, and, uh, and you know, overdose deaths go